It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Kiewetanaw. Uh, speaker, uh, speaker uh, this week, the Chiefs of Ontario released their Ontario-specific Closing the Infrastructure Gap Report. The report stated that it will cost $59 million to ensure infrastructure in First Nations are on par with the rest of the province by 2030. The gap is one of the widest in Canada. If these gaps aren't closed, First Nations health and well-being will continue to far, fall behind. Is Ontario going to continue grow it, to grow its wealth at the expense of First Nations who continue to go without? Yes or no? Mr. of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Can well, of course, the answer is no, Mr. Speaker, and we look forward to the opportunity to move forward on a number of key infrastructure projects, especially with the, those with respect to isolated remote First Nations communities. This member knows that we have met in the past couple of weeks alone with key leadership in communities and on behalf of Indigenous organizations in NAN territory about road access, road access that would allow and provide for the province uh, to develop other legacy infrastructure uh, into the north. The electrification, getting communities off diesel, building bridges so that we can have communities access places like Red Lake and come down uh, to uh, uh, southern, uh, the southern part of northern Ontario for other programs and services and create better access into the north. Those are the things, Mr. Speaker, that we're interested in working on, and I've heard from uh, Indigenous leadership across Northern Ontario, uh, that this is the right way to go. The question is, will the member support those initiatives? And the supplementary question. Uh, speaker, uh, in Ontario, $26 billion is needed to close the, the housing gap in First Nations. Speaker, uh, this Nabaski Nation covers 49 First Nations. They need more than 7,500 homes built now to ensure people are housed. Speaker, uh, I urge Ontario as a treaty partner to improve its approach to, to housing by listening to what is needed and to quit using jurisdiction as an excuse to do nothing. Will this government act yes or no? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Well, uh, it's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, that the federal government has not lived up to its infrastructure uh, uh, opportunity in those communities. This isn't about jurisdiction, Mr. Speaker. This is about a commitment from the province of Ontario to build the kinds of roads that can, can uh, create an opportunity to build uh, state-of-the-art infrastructure in those communities. That's what this is always about. And every time we've tried to have those kinds of discussions with the member opposite, the answer has been, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we can support that. It's, they're in the budget. We've had conversations with Indigenous leadership about building roads. Our winter roads have been compromised, Mr. Speaker, this winter in particular. And it's very clear that First Nations leaderships understand that in order to have state-of-the-art wastewater in response, and, and other essential infrastructure in their communities, they need road access. We're prepared to move on that. The Premier has said that explicitly to Indigenous leadership in the North. Will the member opposite support those initiatives? The final supplementary. Speaker, uh, in uh, 2020, the Ontario Auditor General reported that funding off reserve Indigenous housing is uh, cost shared between Canada and Ontario. What is this government, what this government has spent on programs for Indigenous off-reserve housing is grossly inadequate. And there is nothing in yesterday's uh, housing bill that addresses this. Speaker, the progress, uh, ha, the, what progress has Ontario made in building the 22,000 affordable units needed to meet the housing needs for Indigenous people living off reserve. 
Mr. Indigenous Affairs. In fact, resources for off-reserve housing have increased under this government, Mr. Speaker, and we have some very capable partners across Northern Ontario in particular, and including here in the City of Ontario, who've done a fantastic job of creating off-reserve housing and working in full partnership so that we can accommodate for what is a serious trend, and that is for First Nations people moving off reserves into towns and cities across this province, across Northern Ontario, and here into Toronto. But again, Mr. Speaker, these are pieces that have been in our budget, and every single time that we advance that, that member opposite and the NDP have voted against it. Do they stand for off-reserve housing or not, Mr. Speaker? Thank you very much. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the government introduced a housing bill that is both unambitious and underwhelming. The government has chosen to ignore the top recommendations from its own housing affordability task force, including legalizing fourplexes in towns and cities. What is stopping this government from showing leadership and doing more to build homes in neighborhoods people want to live in? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, well, the number one issue facing communities across the province of Ontario is sewer and water capacity, and that is why we have been talking about this for months, Mr. Speaker, and that is why, of course, uh, we came forward with a 1.8. The Minister of Infrastructure has come forward with a 1.8 billion dollar fund to unilaterally, without the support of the federal government, to unilaterally put those services in the ground so that we can unleash not hundreds of homes, not thousands of homes, but millions of homes across the province of Ontario. That is what the bill does yesterday as well. It targets action so that we can get shovels in the ground faster. It targets those communities that have shovel-ready projects uh, good to go, Mr. Speaker. That is what we do. I suspect that the, leader, that the opposition will support us in this measure, and I encourage them to read the bill but. and support what we have brought forward because it is the best way to get more shovels in the ground and more people into homes. Here, here. Supplementary question. The reason why municipalities have difficulty paying for infrastructure is because of this government's Bill 23. Yeah. You know, when I read this bill, when I read this bill, I've got to say, like, I, I think this government is a sucker for punishment because the Conservatives are once again looking at making it easier to build sprawl on farmland. And the last time the government did this, they launched a criminal RCMP investigation into your own activities. So my question is this. Why do you keep trying to find new ways to pave over farmland? Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Actually, Speaker, the number one obstacle to building homes in the province of Ontario is the lack of infrastructure and the infrastructure deficit that we inherited from the previous Liberal government. The other obstacle, of course, is the lack of transit and transportation, which we inherited from the Order. previous uh, Liberal government. The other problem that we have is a carbon tax, which is making it very difficult for those people who actually build the homes to build homes, Mr. Speaker. The other issue that we're having is the high inflation, uh, high interest rate policies of the federal government, which is making it more expensive to get a shovel in the ground and which was pricing out thousands of first-time home buyers from the market, Mr. Speaker, and that is why we are constantly doing everything that we can to target the investments that we're making, make housing more affordable, remove obstacles, get shovels in the ground, and are doubling down on the biggest investment in Spons. infrastructure in the province's history. We're doing it in the absence of a federal government commitment. We'll continue to do that, and I hope that they'll support this bill. The final supplementary. Conservatives have had six years to fix the housing crisis, and it has never been more expensive to rent or buy a home. That is this government's legacy. That is on you. The worst thing about yesterday's bill is what is not in it. There is nothing in this bill for renters. There is nothing to lower rent. There is nothing to stop illegal evictions. There is nothing to fix the landlord and tenant board. My question is to the Premier. Why does this government keep leaving renters behind? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, nothing could be further from the truth. The policies of this government to reduce costs have us at the highest level of purpose-built rentals ever. Ever, Mr. Speaker. We have never hit this level. Now, moreover, we're going a step further, right? 
because we're also saying that because of unilateral cuts made by the federal government, we're going to do even more to ensure that students have affordable housing as well. That is why we are making, as of right, student uh, housing available to our universities. You know what that does, Mr. Speaker? It puts thousands of rental units back on the market for our communities, Mr. Speaker. We're removing uh, the development charges on affordable housing. We are coming forward with an attainable housing program, Mr. Speaker. I hope that the opposition will support us in these measures, which make Response. housing more affordable, which gets shovels in the ground quicker, which deals with the infrastructure gap, gap left behind by the previous Liberal government. We're getting the job done for the people of the province of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, this government supported my Bill 173 at second reading to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic in Ontario. But I want to be very clear, Speaker. The very first recommendation of the Renfrew inquest was one simple sentence, and so was Bill 173, that the government of Ontario shall recognize that intimate partner violence is an epidemic in Ontario. The declaration does not need another study at committee. Data proves too many lives lost and impacted. The work has been done. The Renfrew inquest recommendations are there. This government has had two years to implement them, and yet they've refused. There is absolutely no need for the government to delay declaring intimate partner violence an epidemic. So my question to the Premier is this. Will the government do the right thing, implement the first recommendation of the Renfrew inquest, and declare intimate partner violence an epidemic today? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I think Parliament, Parliament did the right thing yesterday uh, when it supported uh, that, uh, that declaration, Mr. Speaker. But I encourage the members opposite to consider participating in this committee, Mr. Speaker, which will look at all aspects of how we deal with intimate partner violence. We have committed Order. to a whole of government approach that builds on the incredible work done by Ministers Parsa and Minister Williams on this, Mr. Speaker. Incredible work. Now, if the opposition want to absent themselves from that work, that is a decision they can make, because I know progressive Conservatives stand ready to do whatever it takes to ensure that the services that we provide victims and the services are Order. available to the providers so that they can provide those victims and their families with the best possible Order. options. It includes the Minister Response. of Addic Addictions and Mental Health. It will include the Solicitor General. It will include the Attorney General. And we will leave no stone unturned to ensure that we have the best possible response. I encourage them to participate. If they don't want to, that's a decision they make. Supplementary question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul's. Speaker, again, yesterday this Conservative government said they will support Bill 173, which calls for this government to declare intimate partner violence an, ep an epidemic across Ontario. Of course, once an epidemic is declared, we would expect resources to flow. Naming IPV an epidemic is an excellent first step. It validates the lived experiences, the trauma of countless survivors, their families, and the service providers, frankly, that have been working understaffed, underpaid, under this government government for years to support survivors. It will help honour those who are no longer here. I want to know when the government plans to do this. My question, Speaker, is to the Premier. Survivors can't wait any longer for your committees, your public hearings, your consultations. They have been consulted. The experts have been heard. They shouldn't have the, to recount the worst moments of their life. It's one word. Epidemic. Question. Will this government declare and push through fast track Bill 173 for survivors? Declare intimate partner violence an, an epidemic today. Members will please take their seats. The government house leader. In fact, it's not just the government, it was this parliament that supported that yesterday, Mr. Speaker. Parliament supported that motion yesterday. Now, we've received, I have received many messages from victims, uh, survivors, who have suggested that they want to participate, that they have suggestions on how we can make services better 
for them, Mr. Speaker. I've heard from service agencies over the last 24 hours that say they have more that they can tr contribute. I've heard from First Order. Nations partners who have said we have specific recommendations for our communities. When can we participate? I've heard from the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. I've heard from the Solicitor General, the Attorney General. I have heard from Ministers Williams and Parsa, Children Community Services, and the Minister for uh, Women's uh, uh, Issues, Mr. Speaker. And all of them have said we are doing a lot, but we can do more. The only ones who think that more can be done now seem to be the NDP. So we have supported as a parliament, but what we will do is the next phase, Mr. Speaker, the work that is needed to properly support victims. It's not about virtue signaling, it's about getting the work done properly for them. Thank you. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Our government continues to call on the federal government to walk back their disastrous carbon tax measures. Speaker, this is a tax to which farmers, small business owners, and Ontario families have repeatedly said no. While we are steadfast in making life more affordable for individuals and families in our province, Bonnie Crombie's Liberals and the opposition NDP keep working against us. That's not what their constituents elected them to do. But rest assured, Speaker, our government will continue to have the back of Ontarians, even if the opposition won't. The federal Liberals need to scrap this tax so that hardworking Ontarians can keep money in their pockets where it belongs. Speaker. Can the minister please explain to the House how the Liberal carbon tax Question. burdens families and businesses across Ontario? Stop the clock for a second. I'm going to ask the member for Ottawa South and the Minister of Energy, who are engaged in, I'm sure, a very interesting conversation across the floor of the House, which make it harder for the speaker to hear uh, the member who actually rightfully has the floor and wants to ask a question. And, and as well, there have been a number of members on this side of the House who have been um, heckling quite loudly. I would ask them to stop doing that. Let's start the clock. Minister of Energy can reply. He has. We were having a very uh, interesting discussion. I'm still baffled at the member of Ottawa South uh, support for the federal carbon tax, and of course, the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, his leader, uh, supports that carbon tax as well, which is driving up the cost of everything in our province. We hear from fruit and vegetable growers and grain farmers. We hear from construction workers that are making their way from the suburbs into downtown Toronto, where member we're building Ottawa brand South new subway lines order. like the Ontario Line, and building new roads and highways. Those those parents that are taking their kids to school and driving them to their hockey play playoff games and off to baseball and soccer, which are starting this year. It's making the cost of living more expensive for all of those people. And this morning, I was actually at a really great press conference with the mayor of Toronto, Olivia Chow, and it was a great clean energy announcement down at the Portland's Energy Centre. And she was asked, why is Toronto one of the most expensive cities in North America? And Part of the answer Spons. was the carbon tax, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, which is driving up the cost of everything, not just for the people of Toronto, not just for the people of Ontario, but the people right across. Thank you. Supplementary question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the minister for that response. There are better ways to reach climate targets without jeopardizing affordability for hardworking families and individuals. Unfortunately, the federal government is unwilling to listen to what provincial leaders and, more importantly, what Canadians have to say. Speaker, when Bonnie Crombie was a federal liberal, she was one of the earliest supporters of the carbon tax. And now, as leader of the opposition, the Ontario Liberals, I mean, one of her first orders of business is to call for higher taxes, which is the usual liberal pattern. We know that the last thing that people need right now is another expense on their bills. Ontarians cannot afford the federal Liberals and the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie. Speaker, can the minister please explain how Liberal policies like the carbon tax are costing Ontarians? Minister of Energy. 
Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly clear that the Queen of the Carbon Tax is not just supportive, but happy with the federal carbon tax that's driving up the cost of everything in our province and right across our country, Mr. Speaker. But it's Liberals like the one that's heckling me right now who were here from 2011 to 2018 who tripled electricity rates in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, forcing people to choose between heating Order. and eating. It's those same Liberals, let's be clear, they're the same bunch that were here during the Wynn McGuinty area that have now moved up to Ottawa and are working with Premier Prime Minister Trudeau and the team up there to drive up the cost of everything again with this harmful, brutal carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Now, the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, is clearly supportive of making life more expensive. As a matter of fact, her first edict upon becoming the leader of the Liberal Party was Response. to have her party raise a million dollars to help pay her salary, Mr. Speaker. Oh. Now, we don't need the queen of the carbon tax running our province. It would be just too expensive for the people of Ontario. The next question, a member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. Earl Grey Senior Public School in my riding is supposed to offer extended French. But because of cutbacks and disrespect for teachers, we have a severe teacher shortage. That's meant that students in extended French have gone without teachers for months at a time. This is increasingly a problem in many of our schools. Why won't the Premier provide the funding to Toronto schools to actually have teachers in class? To respond, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, it is an ironic question from the members opposite who have voted against 3,000 additional teachers in Ontario classrooms today. In TDSB, a board that has 10,000 fewer students relative to 2018, they have $120 million more. We've hired additional education staff and we passed a bill to do it quicker. And I would have hoped that the members opposite would have worked with government like other parties did to support acceleration of certification as we cut the timelines by half. That was our commitment. We did it alone without support of members opposite. And, Speaker, we launched a recruitment action plan specific for French educators in Ontario that has yielded over 400 new French language graduates last year, 1,000 additional French language candidates registered relative to the year prior. We know there's more work to do, but let's work together to ensure all children have access to a certified teacher, an item, an issue that is of contrast where the members opposite do not want retired educators in the front of class. Supplementary the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Three hundred and twenty million. That's how much more the TDSB would have this year if funding had just kept pace with inflation, Speaker. The Minister of Education likes to use the word historic a lot, but what is actually historic is the largest cut to education funding in the history of our province. Two point seven billion dollars less this year alone. So instead of hiring EAs and child and youth workers and lunch supervisors and social workers and French teachers, school boards are being forced to cut them. Why does the Premier think our children do not Order. deserve these essential supports? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, it is not going to be surprising to Ontarians to hear members opposite defend the bureaucratic incompetence that takes place in many school boards in this province. But members opposite seem to believe it is acceptable for a board that is the largest real estate holder in the province of Ontario, responsible for $20 billion of assets, who sits on $300 million of unspent maintenance funding, that has $150 million of proceeds of disposition sitting in cash. They've tripled the amount of sunshineless workers. It's about time school boards get a simple message Order. to work to advance Order. the interests of children instead of the interests of administration. Our message is clear. Balance your budgets and do what every school board in this province will do. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Whitby. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Transportation. Hardworking families and business owners in Whitby tell me that the federal government is choosing to ignore 
the challenges Ontario residents are facing. Speaker, at a time when our cost of living continues to rise, the federal Liberals, they doubled down and hiked the carbon tax yet again by 23 percent. Increases in fuel cost makes life more expensive for everyone in our province, including the hardworking men and women in the trucking industry. Speaker, Ontario's truckers play a critical role in transporting the goods we all need in our daily lives. They should not be burdened with additional costs. Question. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please tell the House why the carbon tax is hurting Ontario's truckers? Great question. To reply, the Associate Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member from Whitby for that question, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to represent hundreds of hardworking truckers who live in my riding, Mr. Speaker. Every day, they ensure we have the goods that they deliver, and they tell me all the time, the carbon tax adds unnecessary cost to each delivery that they make, Mr. Speaker. This only makes the cost of everything more expensive, Mr. Speaker. The truckers, they're not asking for a free ride. They're asking for a fair one. Their commitment to our economy is not faced with a penalty, Mr. Speaker. According to the Ontario Trucking Association, the carbon tax of 17.4 cents per litre increases the cost of a long-haul truck between $15,000 to $20,000 per truck per year, Mr. Speaker. It is clear the carbon tax is hurting Response. our economy and making life more expensive, Mr. Speaker. The federal government and Minister Gibo is out of touch. We call on the federal government to axe the tax. Thank you. The supplementary question. But thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for his response. Our government recognizes and appreciates the hardworking men and women in our trucking industry who keep goods moving in Ontario. It's unfair for our truckers to have a carbon tax forced on them by the federal government. And it's unfair that the cost to fuel the trucks to transport the goods is passed on to consumers. Speaker, life is already expensive enough. The trucking industry cannot afford more liberal carbon tax hikes. Neither can every resident, hardworking families in this province. Unlike the out-of-touch NDP and Liberals who continuously to fail to support Ontarians, our government is taking every necessary step to make life easier and, Speaker, Question. more affordable. Can the Associate Minister please tell the House how our government is standing up once again for truckers in Ontario. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, the NDP and Liberals claim the carbon tax is designed for other transition options, Mr. Speaker. But when it comes to long haul trucking, there is no other options. We need to rely on them to keep our economy moving, Mr. Speaker. The carbon tax is only a tax on hardworking people who fill up their car heat their homes and rely on truckers who deliver their goods, Mr. Speaker. I invite Minister Gibo to come to Scarborough to meet the hardworking men and women who rely and deliver our goods, Mr. Speaker. They, they would tell him that carbon tax is making harder for a family to put food on the table yeah. and to heat up their homes, Mr. Speaker, and adding to the inflation, Mr. Speaker. Only this government, under the leadership of Premier Ford and with this Transportation Minister, we will fight for businesses and families, and progressive Conservative government will stand Response. up against carbon tax. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. The Ford Motor Company is pumping the brakes on its Ontario-built electric vehicles, delaying the start of manufacturing from 2025 to 2027. This news has left the more than 5,000 auto workers at Oakville Assembly and throughout the supply chain with an uncertain future. The last built-in Oakville Ford Edge will roll off the line in the weeks ahead. Oshawa auto workers know a thing or two about uncertainty. This government has been taking credit for this Ford deal. I would be very surprised if a two-year delay was part of the deal. So my question is, staring down a two-year delay, what is this government going to do to secure an EV future for auto workers in Oakville? And to reply, the parliamentary assistant and member for Oakville North Burlington.
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that very important question. For years, we've watched as the Liberals, propped up by the NDP, drove away hundreds of thousands of jobs, manufacturing jobs, well-paying jobs, south of the border. But all that changed when we got elected. In the last three years, we've seen $28 billion in new auto and EV investments, wow. resulting in the creation of thousands of good-paying jobs. Last year alone, more than 180,000 good-paying jobs were created in Ontario. And just last month, Ontario was leading the nation in job creation, with 26,100 new jobs added to the province's economy. Ontario is the number two auto producer in North America, building Response. over 1.2 million vehicles annually. We have heard from Ford Canada that they are working closely with Unifor to ensure employees at Ford Oakville site are, are taken care of. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. We will all be proud to build electric vehicles right here in our province and proud of the good jobs and the auto workers who will build them. But Ontario needs a real plan so we can charge them and drive them. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, we are not EV ready and we are falling behind. We need a serious EV strategy to grow development, manufacturing and the charging infrastructure. So my question is, what specifically will this government do to make sure Ontario auto workers build the electric vehicles of the future, and where is the EV infrastructure so we can actually drive them? To reply, the Minister of Energy. Thank you very much. Uh, it is our work that's been done in all sectors of government, but particularly at economic development and on the Ministry of Energy file, where we are securing the power that we're going to need for the electric vehicle implementation, which we know is coming, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're investing in new nuclear facilities in that member's own region, the clean energy capital of Canada in the Durham region, with not one but four small modular reactors, the newest technology, and we're leading the world when it comes to the development of that technology, we're ensuring we have five gigawatts of new development at a Bruce C. power plant over on Lake Huron, Mr. Speaker. The NDP, if they were in charge, are against nuclear power and the 76,000 people that work in that sector in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I don't know where the NDP thinks the power is going to come from. Maybe they think we can continue to power our electric vehicles with intermittent wind and solar. We don't believe that. That's why we're making the investments in the energy infrastructure for the future and are powering Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to ask my question in French for the Minister of Education. Francophone school population is increasing for the past years, especially when we compare that to English schools. We want to build new schools, but the rate is not as fast as expected. In the last budget, the government announced the addition of 22,000 new seats in francophone schools. However, this is not enough to face the increasing of enrollments for this year only, and we are also facing backlog. The Minister of Education announced that $1.3 billion will be invested in order to, to, build, to build and increase the size of medical schools. So my question is simple. How many schools will be built thanks to this investment. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question and uh, the partnership as we work together to build schools across Ontario. We are absolutely committed to building more schools. It's why I was proud to stand with the Minister of Finance on behalf of the Premier to announce the historic more than doubling of funding to build more schools faster in this province for the people of Ontario. We're talking about over $1.3 billion of investment. It was historically at $550 million. This will yield more than double the number of schools we build per year. For French language education, we have invested 
a quarter of a billion dollars to build roughly 18 new schools, 16 school additions. We've created over 7,000 spaces within our schools and likewise over 900 licensed childcare spaces, affordable childcare spaces for French language families. We know there's more to do. It's why our government stepped up with a historic investment to build, to invest and to grow our French language Thank you. school system. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to know what is coming, so thank you for those funds invested. French, Francophone schools, rather, is suffering from a lack of places and a lack of staff. We have a crisis when it comes to retaining staff. In 2020, a report was tabled when it comes to lack of teachers in francophone in the francophone system the, we had to set a strategy for 2021 2025 we are now in 2024 and the problem is still there the government hasn't even mentioned the lack of essential staff for our francophone schools how the government is planning to complement the lack of teachers in francophone system in the francophone system school if you don't have investments I, I do appreciate the concern of the members opposite. Indeed, there is uh, across the country a French language education teacher shortage. It preceded our time, but we announced a, uh, an action through Bill 98, the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act, that allows for additional French language educators to be hired with more latitude to school boards and a reduction in certification interprovincially and around the world as we attract French language teachers from the broader Francophonie. The Minister of Francophone Affairs and I have worked together to cut through the red tape and to attract, and we're seeing some result. A thousand additional French language candidates registered on the recruitment portal just last year. 151 additional internationally trained French language teachers newly certified by the College of Teachers. We've also, Mr. Speaker, I was proud to stand with the Minister of Colleges and Universities to more than double the amount of teacher placements at the University of uh, France, uh, of Ontario and Francais and the University of Ottawa. Together, this is going to make a difference so that we bridge the gap and ensure all children have access to a qualified teacher in Ontario. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is for the Minister of Finance. Speaker, I hear it in the House and I hear it across my riding of Newmarket, Aurora. The carbon tax is making life more and more unaffordable. During this challenging time, families and small businesses in all communities need to feel supported, not penalized. That's why it is disappointing to see the federal government refuse to scrap the tax. To make matters worse, the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, and her Liberal caucus continue to stand behind their federal colleagues. Ontario cannot afford Bonnie Crombie and the Liberal carbon tax she supports. Our government will keep fighting this regressive carbon tax and putting more money back in the people's pockets. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is combating the negative impacts of the carbon tax? Parliamentary Assistant, Minister Finance. Member for Oakville. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Newmarket Aurora for a really, really good question. We have been clear, Speaker, now is not the time to be raising taxes and making life more unaffordable for the people here and across this great province. Unfortunately, it seems like the Liberal plan to tackle affordability is to actually make life more expensive for the people of Ontario and Canada. We saw Liberal members refuse to support a motion to eliminate the carbon tax, which makes goods and services more affordable in this province. We even heard the Liberal member of Canada, Carleton, say that, quote, the vast majority of Ontario households are better off Order. with their carbon price, in spite of all evidence to the contrary. Speaker, it's time for all parties in this House to unite and join us and agree Respond. that this federal carbon tax needs to be eliminated now. Independent members come to order. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for his response. We have heard it from experts, from governments, and from the people of Ontario. The carbon tax hurts our well-being, and it hurts the economic growth of our province. Under the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, the independent Liberals have failed to stand with us against a tax that is driving up prices and hurting individuals and families in our province. They have chosen to ignore the concerns of the people that elected them. That's not fair, Speaker. At a time of economic uncertainty and affordability crisis, let's not tax Ontarians more. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please tell the Question. House what our government is doing to fight the carbon tax? Parliamentary assistant, Minister Finance. Thank you again, Speaker, and to the great member from Newmarket Aurora for that follow-up question. This government will continue to call to scrap the tax. But, Speaker, we know we can't wait around for the Liberal Party to finally do the right thing, and that's why we are taking action here to drive down the price of gas for the people of Ontario. That's why only a few weeks ago we announced a new extension of the gas tax cut, providing direct relief to the people of Ontario at the pumps. This cut means hundreds of dollars in savings for the average Ontario household and billions of dollars across the province. Speaker, our government acted early on affordability, and we aren't stopping now. We will continue to drive down prices and make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, Lancaster Dundas. To the Premier, Speaker, we, we learned yesterday from the Financial Accountability Office that Ontario spends the lowest per capita on health care than the rest of Canada almost 16% below the Canadian average. We are last in Canada. Currently, 2.3 million Ontarians are already without a family doctor, and another 2 million are projected to lose access in two years. Two weeks ago, I stood in this House and asked the question, why are you allowing 60,000 Hamiltonians to go without a family doctor? This financial accountability report gives us the answer. You are shortchanging Ontario's health care spending and funding. Why? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, with the greatest of respect, wrong, wrong, wrong. We have made historic investments in our health care budget, in our health care system. Whether it is expanding primary care, multidisciplinary teams, over a half a billion dollars that we are investing in primary care multidisciplinary teams. Whether it is capital projects that are happening in our hospitals across Ontario, over 50 capital projects that are happening right now across Ontario, new, expanded and renovated hospitals, including, of course, in the Hamilton region. We continue to invest in our health care system. We know that Ontario leads Canada, whether it is attachments to family physician primary care docs, whether it is the lowest wait times in Canada are happening here Spons. in the province of Ontario, we will continue to do that work to make sure that we build up a system that, frankly, previous governments have ignored for decades. And the supplementary question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Not even two weeks ago, I asked the Premier about a fraction of the funding that Greater Hamilton Health Network is going to receive as one-time funding. This is an Ontario health team who brought many expert voices to the table to build a plan which, if fully funded, would provide 55,000 Hamilton area residents with right. a family doctor. A health team that has innovative strategies, dedicated home care professionals, and team-based care close to to home. The minister talks a good game, but is leaving people without a family doctor. Premier, why are you undermining and underfunding the very same groups that you created? Excellent question. Minister of Health. So let me get this clear. We have expanded primary care multidisciplinary teams in the amount of over a billion dollars since February. That equates to 78 new 
primary care health teams, multidisciplinary teams, community health centers, yes, including in the Hamilton area and the Niagara region. We are making those investments so respectfully to the member opposite and the members of her party. Order. Why did you vote against those investments yesterday? Yes. The next question. The next question, the member for Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Every industry in Ontario is negatively impacted by carbon tax. This punitive tax adversely affects our businesses, economy, and Ontario workers, including those in the natural resource sector. Not only does this federally imposed carbon tax make raw materials more expensive, but it also impacts the entire supply chain resulting in higher costs for everyone, everything, and everyone. While the federal government, supported by the independent Liberals and the opposition NDP, is content to pass these costs on to individuals who are already financially struggling, our government knows that Ontarians deserve better. That's why we will continue to call on the federal Liberals to scrap the tax once and for all. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax is negatively impacting industries in the natural resource sector and consumers across Ontario? To reply, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Oxford for that great question. You know, I'll, I'll give the Liberals this. They're consistent, consistently on the wrong side of supporting affordability for Ontarians because their leader, the queen of the carbon tax, just wants to double down and say no all the time. No to Northern Ontario, no to affordability measures, no to building homes and key infrastructure, no to reducing emissions while creating jobs. Mr. Speaker, we, we know what the Liberals are all about. They had years and years and years to get something done. Instead, they drove manufacturing jobs out of this province by the hundreds of thousands. They neglected to build long-term care beds. They certainly neglected to support Northern Ontario. Well, Mr. Speaker, we support Northern Ontario in this government, and we support getting rid of a carbon tax that is nothing but punitive to Northern Ontario and the natural resources sector. Ask the member for Brampton North and the member for Ottawa South to come to order. The member for Oxford, supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, and thank the minister for the response. The federal Liberals and their provincial counterparts are out of touch with how the carbon tax is negatively impacting individuals and families across Ontario. A recent budgetary, the parliamentary budget officer found that most households will lose income due to the federal carbon tax. Specifically, the report states that 60 per cent of households in Ontario and other provinces will pay more in carbon taxes than they receive in rebates. Speaker, the hardworking people and business owners that power our economy have had enough. They want to see this tax scrap now. The federal government must eliminate the carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is delivering relief to the people of Ontario as we fight the carbon tax? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Again, thanks for that uh, great question for the member from Oxford. Uh, and I know the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, won't listen to us about the carbon tax. Again, consistency, I'll give them that. But maybe she'll listen to the federal parliamentary budget officer who said that Ontarians will pay $478 more per household because of the federal carbon tax. Speaker, they said in the year 2030, the average financial loss for Ontarians would be close to $2,000 per household. And it's a shame. The members opposite are putting politics ahead of Ontario's families and businesses. You know, our government cut a fuel tax by over 14 cents a litre. Our government supports innovation and creating jobs and reducing emissions. Our government's creating more jobs, putting more money in people's pockets, and our government is delivering relief for people here in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, the answer is clear. We need to support Ontario Thoughts? in an affordability challenge time. The Liberals need to stand up and scrap this tax. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario Place for All has released a comprehensive audit that shows the Therma Megaspar project cannot succeed without hundreds of millions of dollars in public taxpayer subsidies. 
Therma was just recently at risk of bankruptcy. We still don't know the source of their financing, but they have a secret 95-year lease for prime Toronto waterfront. The public deserve to know what you've signed us up for. Premier, why won't you release the details of the lease with Therma? And to reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I can't believe that I'm actually responding to the question, and I have to educate a colleague of mine on the, on the other side that does not understand what an audit is and who conducts an audit. An audit is conducted by a certified accountant. What we saw yesterday was not, in fact, an audit. It was a presentation that I'm pretty sure grade seven and eight students from schools in my riding could do a better job of. It was a joke, in fact. Mr. Speaker, we will continue with our redevelopment plans at Ontario Place. We are attracting an investment of hundreds of million dollars to build 50 acres of public realm, realm space, brand new stage, wellness and water park facility for the public to enjoy after 30 years of neglect of the site because of the Liberals. Let's get on board. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, if this is such a good deal for Ontario taxpayers, then release the lease. That's right. These, these are the, the tax lease. subsidies for Therma that we know about. Parking garage, $450 million. Infrastructure, $200 million. Science Centre moving, $400 million. An apparently free 95-year lease on public parkland and the maintenance of a portion of Therma's roof. That report from Ontario Place for All yesterday suggested that they may not be able to attract enough customers to actually pay for their business model, to turn a profit. And so the question is, if they go bankrupt, as they almost did in 2019, what does the secret lease say? Are Ontario taxpayers going to be stuck with a billion-dollar boondoggle on the waterfront, or will we be stuck subsidizing Thermos failed business model for the next 95 years? And the Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, I will not, Mr. Speaker, I will not be taking the advice of a political activist group that has no experience conducting an audit or building infrastructure. What I will do is I will work with Infrastructure Ontario, a world-renowned agency that is leading the development of all of our critical and most complex projects in the province, whether it's highways, Order. whether it's hospitals, whether it's schools, long-term care, correctional facilities, they are leading that work. We are working in partnership with Infrastructure Ontario to bring the site back to life. Mr. Speaker, we have two options. We could do what the Liberals did and no, not do anything not and option. let the site fall apart and let it not continue to flood, or we can attract hundreds of millions of dollars I of investment like to the site for a water park, brand new stage, 50 acres of public realm space, brand new marina, food and beverage, so that Ontarians Response? can enjoy the lands once again. I'm with Jingo. The next question, the member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Despite opposition from provincial leaders from all political stripe, last week the federal government hiked the, the carbon tax by another 23 per cent. Ontarians are now forced to pay an extra 17.6 cents per litre on gas. We know that the impact does not stop only on glass, Speaker. How is that right? The federal Liberals, much like their provincial counterparts, don't seem to care about the impact this punitive tax has on various sectors in our province. Speaker, I've heard from people in my riding who are concerned about affordability issues and how this additional tax bill will affect our public safety. Speaker, can the minister please explain the implications of the carbon tax on frontline workers who keep Ontario safe? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Ajax for the question. And she knows how hard first responders and police officers and firefighters work and everyone that keeps Ontario safe. And Mr. Speaker, last night I attended at the Toronto Police College to watch people receive awards for doing heroic acts. They work hard every day. But like everybody else in Ontario, like everybody else on April the 1st, they're now paying 3.3 cents more a litre on fuel and on diesel. And Mr. Speaker, let me put this into context. An average police car 
An average vehicle in public safety is now paying over $2,000 more a year just for the increase on April 1. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? Bonnie Crombie served on the board of Peel. She knows on the police service board Response. this is absolutely true. She should come clean with the people of Ontario and say, I'm not going to support this tax. Order. Order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for that response. It's encouraging to hear of how, unlike Bonnie Crombie's Liberal and the opposition NDP, our government stands up for the hardworking men and women who keep our communities safe. Speaker, last week's hike is one of the many planned increases from the federal government. The federal Liberals actually want to exponentially increase what they call a price on carbon until 2030. Enough is enough. We know that frontline workers deserve to have the support and resources they need to protect Ontarians instead of paying for additional fuel costs because of the carbon tax. It is time to scrap the tax. Speaker, can the Solicitor General further explain the effects of the costly carbon tax on how our public safety system? Thank you. Once again, the Solicitor General to reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's Carbon tax is paid on everything that's involving public safety. And Mr. Speaker, let me be specific, because it's important for the people who live in Milton, as example, to know that Halton Police Service has to pay the carbon tax on their vehicles. And they can call Chief Steve Tanner if they want to know. And for the people living in Strathroy, they can call Chief Mark Campbell. But I want to give another, another fact to the Legislature. Bonnie Crombie, as the mayor of Mississauga, knew exactly what the fire department budget is there. So let her know this. Because of the 3.3 cents that went into effect on April 1 on this regressive tax, an average fire truck now has to pay over $2,000 a year just for the latest increase. She's out of touch with reality. She should come clean with the people of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For years, my constituents have been contacting my office looking for help to Order. find a doctor. Over 2.0 million people in Ontario are without a primary care provider. The government has made announcement after announcement, but yet we haven't seen doctors. My constituent, Kathleen, has not had a family doctor for over nine years. She has MS and has recently lost her doctor, who specializes in MS care and cannot find another neurologist. Order. Can the Premier tell people like Kathleen where she can find a doctor? The Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Absolutely. Uh, the first thing I hope you have recommended to your constituent is that she sign up for Health Care Connect. It's a little known fact that, in fact, individuals who are on Health Care Connect and have signed up to get connected with a primary care physician have a 90 day or less matching rate. So there is a process that existing. Now, in terms of expanding primary care, I, I want to Order. remind the member where we were. Under the previous NDP government, your government actually cut medical residency seats by 10 per cent. The Liberal government, when they were in power, cut residency positions by 50 seats per year. What has that put us into? A position where we are building the health care system. We are expanding. Last week, we had an incredible announcement in Vaughan with the Minister of Education Response. announcing a brand new medical school that is coming to Vaughan. Speaker, this medical school will actually focus on training primary care family physicians. That's what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, um, health care connect should be called health care disconnect. Kathleen, along with millions of Ontarians, have been languishing for years on Health Care Connect. They spend hours calling every doctor in London. As soon as the word gets out, there's a new doctor taking patients. They're inundated with applications. People with pre-existing conditions find it even harder to access primary care. Doctors are telling you that they need help with increased workloads so they can take on more patients. Premier, 
Will you implement the NDP's health care strategy today to increase the number of staff supports for doctors so they can spend time treating patients instead of pushing paperwork? Minister of Health. So, spe Speaker, I have to ask, why, why, why have the NDP not supported a billion-dollar investment in primary care expansion, 178 new expanded satellite and Order. new facilities where we are connecting patients with multidisciplinary teams? It, it was said very eloquently where when you need a family doc, you will see a family doc in these multidisciplinary teams. If you need to see a nurse practitioner, you will see a nurse practitioner in these family health teams. And you know, I have to I have to give a shout out to one of our members. Minto Township, in fact, has already hired a nurse practitioner and they are already seeing new patients from a February announcement. These are the changes that are happening in our community across Ontario and we'll continue to get it done. Thank you. The next question, the member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Please Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs or Northern Development. Individuals and families across Ontario, especially in Northern and Indigenous communities, face unprecedented economic challenges due to additional costs arising from the Liberal carbon tax. Speaker, residents in the North rely more heavily on their vehicles for work and for other everyday essentials. It's not fair that they're being hit the hardest at the gas pumps. Unlike the opposition members and independent Liberals who remain silent, even after last week's 23 per cent hike, our government will continue to stand up for all Ontarians and call for the end of this tax. Speaker, can the minister please share with the House the negative impacts of the disastrous carbon tax on the Northern and Indigenous communities? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, as the former Liberal MP, Bonnie Crombie, stood resolute with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau as the carbon tax received royal assent. That would make her the queen of the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Now, the NDP's position has been a little bit more higgledy-piggledy. It's not clear. They support it. They're against it. We don't really know, Mr. Speaker. So I went on a zetetic exploration to understand from the people in Sudbury how they felt about this. One owner of a roofing company said that the carbon tax has made its way into every aspect of building materials, making it more expensive to repair homes and making it more difficult for people to decide to repair those homes. Another fellow, Richard Diot, uh, the owner and president of Barn Building, Response. said the cost for residential upgrades, Mr. Speaker, and repairs has gone out of control, and he puts it squarely on the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. That's not good for families. As the member of Canada, Canada Carleton. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. The member for Mississauga.